So food now is incredibly, incredibly addictive. I just I went to America recently for a conference and I was at the Statue of Liberty and I had to happen to be standing next to a lady in the queue and I, I got chatting to her and she was just a, a, a scientist and she worked for a, a large donut company. And I was curious and I was I said, oh, so what do you do? You know, food scientist, donut company, that sounds very interesting. And she talked through the process of, uh, you know, how they would craft the food and uh, that have taste testing panels and whole teams of people to make the food very addictive, you know, the right combination of sugar, salt and fat and all got to get the mouthfeel right. And she was also incredibly proud how they can add all these preservatives to a donut so that you could have a donut that was three weeks old that was sitting out in the open air and it was completely indistinguishable from a fresh donut. But that's beside the point. The point is these foods are addictive. And as humans... We have evolved to respond to addictive stimuli. So the two behaviours that the human species need is dependent on for survival is procreation and eating. And both those behaviours are driven by serotonin and dopamine, which are two you know, happy chemicals. We call them neurotransmitters in our brain. They get released. So if you've sort of got deficient levels of these chemicals, which can happen for, you know, Uh, certain health reasons, if you've got an iron deficiency or what we call chronic inflammation, which is a bit of a broad term, but if we have these issues in our body, that lowers our neurotransmitter levels. But we're, we're hardwired as humans to chase these chemicals. So what do we do? What's our most ready access to get a supply of these chemicals when we're deficient? Well, in our modern environment, when we're surrounded by addictive foods, we just go to addictive foods. So that's a huge drive. And we think we're in control of our eating, but we're, we're often not. And then the consequences are not just that these foods are addictive, but what they do to our hormone levels. So with all these sugar and carbohydrates, we know they release a hormone called insulin from our pancreas into our bloodstream. And insulin is the hormone of obesity. So without insulin, our fat cells cannot get fat. That that's our fat cells can only store fat under the influence of insulin. In actual fact, they did a very interesting study on some uh, adolescents and they measured their insulin levels and they just put them into four groups. You're in the bottom 25%, the top 25% or one of the two middle quartiles and they followed them for eight years. And then at the end of the eight years, they they measured the insulin levels again to see who was in the the bottom, the top. And they found that if you were in the top level of insulin at both points of time across that eight-year period, then your chance of becoming obese was something like 36 times greater than the people with the lowest insulin levels. So we've got very strong prospective data. Any type 1 diabetic, as a doctor, we were condition called type 1 diabetes, which is where the, the body releases not enough insulin. The pancreas, the beta islet cells in the pancreas, which makes insulin actually die and you can't produce insulin. So how does a type 1 diabetic present? Well, they're emaciated. They waste away. And it's not just fat. It's muscle too. Their, their whole bodies waste away essentially they'll die. So we treat them with insulin injections, which is life-saving, which is another facet. And then, so what happens? Where do we tell them to inject? We say, just inject in your lower abdomen. And if they use large doses of insulin because they're, you know, for whatever reason, and they don't rotate their insulin sites, they're always injecting into the same sites in the lower abdomen. Well, you get these mounds of fat tissue forming there. We know in type 1 diabetics that where they inject, they develop fat masses. And we're not just talking about a little bit lumpy. If you want to Google this, uh, lipo, meaning fat hypertrophy, hypertrophy meaning excessive growth, you'll get some fascinating images. It looks like mammary glands or breast tissue, which is plastered onto the lower abdomen, they're really quite prominent lumps. So the evidence that we have that the hormones drive obesity is absolutely huge. So you've got these two factors. We've got addictive food and often we understand we're hardwired to chase dopamine and serotonin, which these addictive foods provide, 
and especially if we're in a state of ill health, iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, chronic inflammation, what have you, then and we're going to be relatively depressed. We're going to be living in a black cloud or a grey veil. And the way that we get transient release out of that is by eating these very addictive foods. We get a squirt of dopamine and serotonin into our brains and transiently we'll feel good. That is so such a strong driving force. 